Welcome to the Holston Valley Unitarian Universalist Church. I am the Reverend Tiffany Sapp, and I am so glad to be with you here today. Today we celebrate Labor Day weekend and the deep benefits that the labor movement has gifted our society. The Southern Appalachian region has a deep connection to struggles for economic justice and environmental justice, and we are going to highlight a few of those today. Because honestly, I'm tired of the stereotype that gets put on the people of this area. But I'll say more about that in the sermon. After our chalice lighting, our prelude will feature images of people in Southern Appalachia doing the work of economic and environmental justice set to the music of Black Waters, written by the mother of folk music, Jean Ritchie. Black Waters became a rallying cry for the ever-growing outrage against the environmental devastation caused by strip mining. The ballad connects the exploitation of the Appalachian laborers to the exploitation of the Appalachian mountains, making it a fitting setting for the story that we want to tell today. But first, we will light our chalice for the world that we want to create together. We light this chalice, symbol of our purpose to bring more love and justice into the world. We light this chalice knowing our congregation is a church dispersed across communities, not bound by walls, but connected through the web of life. I come from the mountain, Kentucky is my home, where the wild deer and the black bears so lately did roam. By the cool rushing waterfall, the wildflowers dream, and through every green valley there runs a clear stream. Now there's scenes of destruction on every hand, and only black waters run down through my land. Sad scenes of destruction on every hand. Black waters, black waters run down through my land. Well, the quail, she's a pretty bird and she sings a sweet tongue. In the roots of tall timber, she nests with her young. The hillsides explode with a dynamite roar. And the voice of the small bird is heard there no more. And the mountain comes a sliding so awful and grand. And the flooding black waters rise over my land. Sad scenes of destruction on every hand. Black waters, black waters run down through my land. In the coming of springtime we planted our corn. In the ending of springtime we buried our sun. In the summer come a nice man saying everything's fine. My employer just requires a way to his mind. Then they tore down the mountain and covered my corn. Now the grave on the hillside's a mile deeper down. And the man stands a talking with his hat in his hand. While the poison black waters rise over my land. Sad scenes of destruction on every hand. Black waters, black waters run down through my land. 
ain't got no money, not much of a home. I own my own land, but my land's not my own. But if I had ten million, somewhere's thereabouts, I'd buy Perry County and throw them all out, and sit down on the bank with my bait and my can, and watch the clear waters run down through my land. Well, wouldn't that be like the old promised land? Black waters, black waters, no more in my land. Black waters, black waters, no more in my land. I'm Sarah Sanders, and I'm happy to be here with you today as your service leader. We will sing Loving Kindness next. Please hold a light in your heart to dispel the darkness, to honor someone or some event, or to lift up a memory. Our reading today comes from Elizabeth Katz's book, What You Are Getting Wrong About Appalachia. The book is largely a response to J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy, criticizing his work as material that harmfully sensationalizes and misrepresents Appalachian culture. Cat explores the many ways that people in Appalachia have resisted their own exploitation and points to the diversity that can be found in Southern Appalachia. In this excerpt, she highlights the reactions of the citizens of Pikeville, Kentucky, to the invasion of a League of the South white supremacy rally into their town. There are many things that have come to Appalachia that no one wanted, but how I respond to them once they're here is important. Many local residents did indeed counter protest. Their willingness to do so was a product of life and community shaped by racism. They marched, some wearing red bandanas, and captured video of the event that they later set to bluegrass music and share in forums populated by other Appalachians. One protester exclaimed, Well, Nazis put out a call to white families to come here, and I'm here as the mother of a white family to say that Nazis aren't welcome in Appalachia. We have real problems here with pipelines, oil and gas and coal companies are poisoning water and air. A few people are getting rich while our children get sick, and Nazis come in and tell us to blame that on other poor people because they have different color skin? Please. Local counter-protesters took explicit steps to connect their identities as both Appalachians and anti-racists and put this identity to work in the service of social change. It's a form of activism that, much like the racism that compelled them to act, is wholly consistent with the region's history. I'm an 80s and 90s kid, which means that in my teen years, just as I was discovering the genre of adult comedy, Jeff Foxworthy was all the rage. Having family connections in the South, but a military brat lifestyle that had me living all over the country, I thought that Jeff Foxworthy's You Might Be a Redneck one-liners were the height of comedy. I was a teenager, what can I say? Actually though, some of them are kind of funny. And Mr. Foxworthy says that the best ones come from the things that he actually witnessed himself. Like his sister inspired this one. 
If you have a complete set of bowls and they all say Cool Whip on the side of them, you might be a redneck. And I can personally relate to if you think the phrase recipe for disaster has something to do with your wife's chili, you might be a redneck. But some are a lot more ouch. If nothing under your Christmas tree is paid for, you might be a redneck. This was my first introduction to the word redneck, and it sure does paint a picture. But the word has a deeper history and a deeper meaning than Southerners of a particular tax bracket using igloo coolers as luggage. And that's what I'm investigating today. Back when farming was the main way to survive in the South, the term redneck was an allusion to the sunburned necks that white farmers would sport after bending over their crops all day. This in itself indicates a certain socioeconomic status because plantation owners were certainly not getting sunburns on the backs of their necks. They forced enslaved people to do that for them. But in the 1920s, redneck began to take on a new meaning. The battle for Blair Mountain was one of the most significant labor strikes in American history. The mining companies had been exploiting both the people and the land around Blair Mountain since the 1800s. The miners who toiled in life-threatening conditions for gruelingly long days were often not even paid in real money, but in company scrip, which could only be exchanged at company-owned stores. They were paid very low wages that they would then turn around and use to buy necessities and even to rent their mining equipment from their employers. Once a person got into this system of perpetual poverty, there really wasn't a way out. The mining company owns you in all but name. In the words of the famous labor song, you owe your soul to the company store. Attempts to organize labor unions to improve conditions were prohibited by the company. And when the miners of Blair Mountain attempted to organize anyway, the organizers were evicted from their company owned homes and then the shooting started. The United Mine Workers marched on Blair Mountain to free imprisoned union men and to raise awareness of the plight of the workers. They were a multiracial coalition. Many were armed with the rifles and bayonets that they had brought home from World War I, and they wore red bandanas, becoming the new rednecks the ones that identified with the exploited working classes, the ones that knew that liberation was often a bloody battle. The Army and National Guard were called in. Bombs, machine guns, and maybe even chemical warfare were deployed on the protesters. We don't know how many people died, but estimates hover around 100. These are my rednecks, people of all races banded together to stand up against their exploitation. It's a far cry from the depiction of our region and the people in it as being all white, all stupid and poor, eternally voting against their own interests. This stereotype was the main, main inspiration for Elizabeth Katz's book, What You Are Getting Wrong About Appalachia. In her book, I learned that this stereotyping isn't a recent trend. Sure, the most recent incarnations of the monochromatic depiction of Southern Appalachia 
comes from J.D. Vance's hillbilly elegy and countless northern reporters' attempts to investigate what they call Trump country. But they go back way, way further. I don't have time to lay out the intricate arguments and copious examples that were laid out in her book today, so I'm going to cut to the punchline. Portraying the people of this region as ignorant, inbred, backward racists has been tied up inextricably with the agenda of outsider profiteers to seize people's land for their natural resources. Timber, coal, and hydroelectric plants, that's what it's really about. In the 1920s and 1930s, the same time that the coal miners of Blair Mountain were fighting for their lives and basic freedoms, photojournalists and sociologists were sent into Southern Appalachia to find justification for land grabs. Cat writes, their work largely follows a pattern of casting mountaineers as a primitive, isolated and backward people with a homogenous white ethnic identity and monoculture degraded through idleness and inbreeding. These less evolved individuals, the experts argued, could only be saved by the intervention of outsiders. And of course, being saved by these expert outsiders often meant relocation, which then might coincide with the flooding of your homeland to build a new dam. Sometimes it even meant eugenics, intentional attempts to sterilize people and take away their children. All of this is to say that the stories that we tell about people and about groups of people matter deeply. Stories have the power to liberate and the power to oppress. Stories have the power to shape the growth of a people and a culture. So I'll say it again, the stories that we tell matter. I am not denying that there are difficult and frustrating aspects to living in this region. Our vaccination rate is frustratingly low. We don't have to dig very deep to scratch the surface of systemic racism. Our politicians behave in ways that lead me to believe that they would rather score points with their base than save the lives of children. So it does make sense that we might be tempted to blow off some steam by engaging in stereotypical jokes. And it makes sense that some folks talk about leaving the region too. And Elizabeth Cat did just that. She grew up in Southern Appalachia, but then did what all the highly educated kids are expected to do, leave. But she discovered something shocking when she left the region, human exploitation and environmental degradation met her in every place that she fled to. It turns out that's a human failing, not unique to Appalachia at all. Sometimes we have to decide where to make our stand. And so I stand here with the mountains around me and my family's roots holding me to the ground. And when we mine our region's history for good examples, Sometimes we find better stories to tell. In 1929, Elizabethton, Tennessee was the site of one of its own labor strikes. The women of American Glanzoff textile mill walked out in protest of low wages, oppressive policies that target, targeted women specifically, and unfair promotions. The United Textile Worker Union showed up and others began to strike with them in solidarity. 
rounds of negotiations began. Labor representatives were kidnapped. The military was called in, not to protect workers from kidnapping, but to put on a threatening show of force in support of the industrialists. Machine gun nests haunted the footsteps of strikers in Elizabethan. Sounds kind of like Blair Mountain, doesn't it? In the end, the efforts were only half successful for the people of Elizabethan. The unions were never recognized and many who sided with the unions found themselves unemployable afterwards, despite the company's promises that there wouldn't be any punitive measures. But the strike in Elizabethan created a ripple effect, inspiring a series of other textile organizing efforts throughout Appalachia. The fortitude, the power that it takes to stand up against both the industrial power brokers and the military might of the government is mind boggling to me. Would I have the guts to face down the same forces today? Would I do what I knew to be right for myself and coworkers, even if I knew that a happy ending was unlikely? I honestly don't know. That's an important aspect of the labor stories of Appalachia and of so many other labor stories. For many of the individuals that rose up, their endings lacked the Hollywood appeal that many of us look for in a good story. For some, their ending was death. For many more, unemployability was the end of their journey. But when we look at the big picture, the widest picture, the historical picture, progress has been made even if there is always more to be done. And so we look for real stories and we discover our heroes in the real Appalachia that lives and breathes all around us. The rednecks of Blair Mountain, the women of Elizabethton, the people of the Highlander Center just down the road whether our families have been farming this land since it was the state of Franklin, or if we moved in last week, we are the people of Appalachia too. And it's time to get our stories right. <laughs> Mountain's roots go immeasurably deep. How many millions of years? Caves that predate mammals, birds, reptiles. The mountains wear down, but they stay, they persist. And so do we. We are Appalachia, close to the earth, mud and coal and stone. We stay, we persist. With folk singers that raise their voices, we stay we persist. With mothers counter-protesting, we stay, we persist. With striking miners who raise their voices, we stay, we persist. Our flame burns along the veins of coal like a red bandana and a red neck. As we go out, as we stay in, our flame goes with us. We stay, we persist. We stay, we persist. 
And I'm so glad we're doing this world transforming work together. As we go about our week, I hope we find our allies, our people, and our stories. Even when we're in the minority, even when the voices of hate are loud, our people are out there and our people are right here with us. Even though we aren't in person on Sunday mornings right now, our building is beginning to be a place for our community to gather again in the forms of small groups and committee meetings, which means it could use a little love. If you'd like to help care for our grounds and facilities, please contact Greg Kramer at facilities at hvuuc.org. Please visit our website or like us on Facebook to stay in touch with us and to find out how to become more involved with our community. And we will post another service on YouTube next Sunday. To help protect the most vulnerable among us, we encourage everyone who is able to get the COVID-19 vaccination. And if you're having a hard time, you don't have to go it alone. Reach out to me or the caring team if you need someone to talk to. Our postlude is written by Kentuckian Merle Travis. This is 16 tons. Some people say a man is made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood. Skin and bone, a mind that's weak and a back that's strong will load 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. I was born one morning, it was driven rain. I picked up my shovel and I loaded 16 tons, a number nine coal, and the straw boss said, well, bless my soul, I loaded 16 tons, what do you get, another day older and deeper in debt, St. Peter, don't you call me, cause I can't go, I owe my soul to the company store. Mr. Iron and the other is Steve.